Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word Dipnophysist. Truly, Ron, that cannot be a real word. Well, in fact it is. What, pray tell, does it mean? Simply put, it is a person skilled in table talk. I see. And how does that fit our story? Eh, it doesn't. Martha, I I have something to ask you. Darling, it's been such a lovely afternoon here on the mountain. Martha, I I want a divorce. Divorce? Yes, there is someone else. I need my freedom. No, I won't give it to you. I thought that would be your answer, my dear. Then why did you ask me? Because, Martha, I did not want to kill you. Howard? Yes, Martha. They've got to be rid of you. That's why I brought you to the mountain. There is a precipice over there. It is a long fall, my dear. We might as well begin with a description of the events leading up to your wife's falling over the precipice. As you wish, Sergeant. It was such a lovely afternoon that Martha, my wife, and I decided to come up here to the mountain. We brought some lunch with us and planned to make a day of it. About what time was that, sir? I, it was about three o'clock. Mm, I see. That would you go on, please? About four o'clock, it began to thunder. And very shortly thereafter, lightning and rain started. Did you find shelter? Yes. We were rather fortunate to find a cave about a hundred yards from here on the west side of the mountain. What time uh, did it stop raining? About uh, an hour later, Sergeant. What did you do then? This is quite a lot of questioning, Sergeant. Is it all necessary? Yes, I'm afraid it is. I I hope you don't object. We're almost through. No, not if it is necessary. Well, uh, to continue. We left the cave and continued to the crest of the mountain. As we got to the top, my wife called my attention to a rainbow, which had suddenly appeared to the west behind the sun. And that was about five o'clock? Yes. Well, when Martha saw the rainbow, she suggested, as a sort of joke, that we try to follow to the end of the rainbow. You know the pot of gold at the rainbow's end? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, what happened after she suggested it? I laughed and tried to dissuade Martha from the idea, but she began running down the incline and waiting for me to follow her. Did you? No, I shouted for her to turn back, but she was running downhill too quickly to stop. Suddenly, she slipped on some loose rock and fell down. She turned over and over and rolled right off the precipice. It was horrible. There was no way you could have helped her? Of course not. Are you insinuating... No, my mountain climbing friend, I'm merely saying that I don't believe your story. It's a lie. How does the state policeman know that Howard lied in the story of how his wife met her death? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Wow, that guy sounds a lot like Dracula. Yes, and he is quite the diagnosophist. Oh, hey, you used my word. I did. I found it quite interesting. Wait, you actually liked something I did? No, what I said was that I like the word. You are still an idiot. Good to know. Furthermore, you are a dunderhead. So you've said before. I could go on. There are so many other synonyms I could use. No need, I think we get the point. And now, back to our story. Howard, your story contained one rather obvious flaw which condemns it as a lie. 
You told me just a few minutes ago that after the storm cleared, you and your wife discovered a rainbow to the west, behind the sun, which, my friend, is an impossibility. A rainbow is always formed opposite the sun by the reflection of its rays. Foiled by sunlight. Actually, the refractive index can be wavered by incandescent light retention. So the police officer is wrong? No, but I made you think about it. More utter nonsense. Which, I believe, is the point of the Minute Mystery, is it not? Yes, that is the point. I'm glad. I wouldn't want to give any other impressions. No, no, we wouldn't want to do that. What's that you say? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. On the show today, we review the audiobook, The Space Race, have a story about a noisy ghost who slams doors, and tell the OTR story about a self-made superhero. We end the show with a Johnny Is It True segment created by listener Kevin Bishop, a true collection of Ripley's Believe It or Not. So, some really good stuff. We also have an email today. It was sent in by Peasty's Dropity. Sorry if I didn't get the pronunciation right. I have not seen your name before. I think it might be Greek, but you didn't say where you were from. So, my apologies. Peasty's writes, Hey Ron, I love the show and had to comment on a story that you had last week. You thought that one of the ghosts could have been a banshee. I think it might have been an atafoy. They are believed to be the spirits of people whose bodies had not received a proper burial. A prime example comes from Homer's Odyssey. Elpinor, a companion of Odysseus, fell off the roof while intoxicated, and his body was left without burial. When Odysseus later visited the underworld, Elpinor's shade appeared to him and begged the hero for a proper burial. Atafoi are said to be insistent and quite scary. Well, thank you for that comment, Pisties. I have read Homer's Odyssey and know that part of the story well. If I remember right, Odysseus had to give some of his blood in order to talk to the ghosts he encountered. To me, that does not sound fun. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle, whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? The Space Race an audible original narrated by Kate Mulgrew. I love history, and that should come as no surprise to you. This one is a major documentary drama that brings to life the past, present, and future of man's exploration of space. It is wonderfully narrated by Kate Mulgrew, who is the captain of the Voyager for seven seasons of Star Trek. Here's a bit of what you will hear from this Audible book. Between July 1969 and December 1972, 12 men walk on the moon. That's just closed. Barely. Hey, Jack, don't lock it. I'm not going to lock we, it. We got we to go back there. You lose the key and we're in trouble. They collect rocks, okay. conduct experiments, just jump, drive, there. and even sing. I was strolling on the moon one day. In the merry, merry month of December. Now, May. 
Bay. Bay, the Bay, that's right. It seems like the beginning of a great adventure. And as we leave the moon and Taurus Littrell, we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return. With peace and in hope for all mankind. Godspeed to crew of Apollo 17. But since those final words, spoken by Apollo 17 commander Gene Cernan, no one has been back. Ah, shoot. Okay, hey, let's get off. Forget the camera. Challenger Houston, we'd like to terminate ascent feed now. In 2014, Cernan visits the site where the Apollo missions left the Earth, Launch Complex 39, and he's not happy. Considering where we were half a century ago when Americans were walking on the moon. It's incredible. And yet we obliterated that piece of history. Yeah, it was more than nostalgic. It was disappointing. And I do indeed do not want to remember those launch pads that sent us to the moon at Kennedy the way I saw them here. Ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. Something's it's wrong. It's not right. It's not the way it was supposed to be. All we've done now is proved we can do it, close the barn door, and said, you know, be happy about it. And that's not good enough. We are going to go back to the moon. Why? All we did was prove we can work and survive up there. Now we got to take advantage of the resources the moon has to offer us here on this planet. And it's a stepping stone to go to that place called Mars. With unprecedented access, the space race takes listeners to the Virgin Galactic Space Program in the Mojave Desert features conversations with Buzz Aldrin, Gene Carmen, Tim Peake, and numerous key players at Mission Control. This Audible original takes you behind the scenes to see how these exciting adventures in outer space came to be. You can have the space race today. Here is what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you too can head into space with Kate Mulgrew. Thank you, Audible. And now... It's time for your stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. Our story for this week was sent in via the website by Ariel Kistner. Ariel now lives in Bamberg, Germany, but this story took place in American Fork, Utah. I had to look that one up, and it is a real place. American Fork was settled in 1850 by Mormon pioneers. The population? Well, in 2020, it was 33,307. How about that? Hey, Ron. I had an unexplainable experience occur about five years ago. As stories go, this one, I think, falls into the head-scratcher category. Now, I know that you like us to title our stories, so I have given it a video game title. Ghost Recon. One of my go-to video games. I was a junior in high school. After the school day was over, my best bud, at the time, and I went over to his dad's house. With the house to ourselves, our plan was to hunker down in his room and play MCC Halo 2 on Legendary and see how truly hard the game is. Spoiler, it's really hard. Editor's Note MCC stands for the Master Chief Collection. I had to look that one up, too. 
We were in the middle of level outskirts, just before you reach Jackal Sniper Alley, when in the next room, we heard a noise. The door to the garage squeaks loudly when it's opened. Our ears catch that very noise, and we paused the game. We were staring out the bedroom door into the hallway. Then we watch as the doorway to the laundry room opens and then closes on its own. We were expecting to see who was coming in from the garage, assuming that it was going to be his dad. Instead, the garage door slams so hard we could feel it. We were stunned and started freaking out because no one else should have been home. So I immediately assumed that there was an intruder. We gathered some random items to use as weapons and literally breached the garage like a Rainbow Six siege. We stacked up and opened the door as I yelled, Who's ever in there? Come out! Right now! Silence. Stale silence. And utter darkness. We flipped on the lights and began to search the garage. I told my buddy to check to see if the side door to the backyard was locked. It was. While he looks around outside, I make note that there are no windows in this garage. No feasible escape that wouldn't leave a trace for us to find. All there was was a rusty old truck and a bunch of empty cabinets. Oh, and yes, we searched the truck and the cabinets. No one was in the garage except us. I've told multiple people this story over the years, and there has not been a single explanation that I haven't already accounted for or disproved. The obvious is the wind. Not. It was a completely calm day outside. Besides, we would have heard the garage door rattling if the wind was hard enough to open and slam a door. I would like to note that there is the possibility that someone did actually break in and manually open the garage door to slide underneath it. However, that's not very likely. Not only would we have heard it move, but the button to open the garage door is on the other side of the room. How could he have opened the door and closed it too? Didn't happen. There's also the possibility that in the midst of panic, my bud mistook the side door for being locked when it actually wasn't. The problem? That door has an auto lock on it. The family kept forgetting to lock it at night and things kept being stolen from them. So, hence the auto lock. No matter which way you cut it, I have a freaky ghost home intruder story that just can't be explained. Kind of like trying to play Halo 2 on Legendary Difficulty. Ariel Kistner, Bamberg, Germany. Well, I have to agree, that is a head scratcher. I once had a similar experience. We have a storage shed in our backyard. One day I heard the door to the shed open and close. The problem is that the lock broke a long time ago, so I put a padlock on it. I went out there to check, and that lock was secure. So I have no idea what happened there, either. Thank you for sharing your story, Ariel. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you would like to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please, tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from the old-time radio series, Escape. It's narrated by William Conrad, and that is a story in itself. More later. An ex-pilot answers an ad for volunteers to take part in a sensory deprivation experiment to create the enhanced human. Things go well, but not all is as it seems. Common sense gets a buff as well. 
The tale is titled The Man from Tomorrow, and it first aired on August 23, 1953. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are the subject of an experiment. An experiment to make you the most powerful man on earth. While if it succeeds, from that moment, you will be forever locked in a world from which there can be no escape. So listen now as Escape brings you Irving Reese's extraordinary story, The Man from Tomorrow. Started with a want ad in the daily paper. Wanted ex fighter pilot must be in perfect health and prepared for rigid tests. Successful candidate will receive good pay and will be given opportunity to contribute to daring experiment and world betterment. Science Associates, 126 West Street. 126 West Street turned out to be one of those ultra modern, super scientific buildings. No windows, and air conditioned as cool as a north wind off an iceberg. About 60 guys had answered the ad. Hi, Major. Hi, Randy. Yeah, been a long time. Yeah. Some of the faces were familiar, guys that had been in my fighter wing. We sat there, 60 of us, and waited. An hour. Two hours. Nothing happened. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting out of here. This place gives me claustrophobia. Hey, it's locked. We're locked in here. And even before this had a chance to sink in, another door opened on the far side of the room. A guy with a white mask on his face came in, carrying a Thompson submachine gun. Hey! Hit the deck! They all flattened on the floor except me. I made a dash for the man in the mask, but he disappeared as quickly as he'd come. Hey, how come you didn't hit the floor, Dick? You tired of living? He was shooting blanks. Couldn't you see? Weren't any bullets chipping anything? That was a gag. I don't like this. Come on, let's crash the door and get out of this rat trap. Save it, save it, Randy. It won't do any good. They can keep us bottled up till they're good and ready to let us go. And then something else. Thick, black, acrid smoke pouring out of the air conditioning vents. And a sound from somewhere. An airplane diving... Every pilot remembers with horror the smell of burning oil from a plane out of control. It hit us way back and deep down. Some of the guys got panicky. I pushed Randy down to the floor. You get more air down here. Now relax. Then the blowers reversed. And that smoke was sucked out quickly. And a loudspeaker cut in from nowhere. Attention, please. Hey, quiet down, fellas. Quiet down. Take it easy. For the past two hours, you have been under close observation as a necessary part of this test. You were warned in advance the test would be rigid. As you file out past the guard, you will receive a token compensation for your time and discomfort. We now ask you all to leave except the man who ran for the gunner. The door is now open. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like you got the job, Major. Looks like I'm going to shove it right back in their faces, Randy. Well, so long. Yeah. See you soon. So long, Randy. Take it easy. Oh. Yeah. Your name, please. 
Well, I hardly expected to find a blonde at the bottom of this. You will come with me, please. Don't give me orders, Blondie. I just want to see the guy responsible for this. Then I'm getting out of here. I take it you have lost interest in contributing to the world benefit. Is that what it said in the ad? Well, whatever your lofty purpose, I don't like cold-blooded cruelty. Unfortunately, personal feelings cannot enter into these steps toward our objectives. Then your objectives are wrong. You will be better able to judge that when you know what they are. I don't think I'm interested. And if I may have a personal feeling, callousness is unattractive enough in a man. Neither your feelings nor mine will matter in this project. Major, I understand that it was. Mr. Mr. Kenman, the war is over, Miss... Dr. Frost. Poetic. I beg your pardon? Nothing. I sometimes mutter to myself. If it is possible for you to unlock your quite superior intellect from emotional reactions common to schoolgirls and fishwives, my senior colleague, Professor Baird, and I will attempt to convince you on the only basis that it should appeal to a mature mind. Facts. <laughs> By all means, Dr. Frost. Oh, but Professor Baird, where'd you get the notion of asking for fighter pilots? Simple. Only one man in 10,000 was able to qualify mentally and physically for fighter training. Additional, uh, additional eliminations due to flunkouts, mortality in training and combat brings the total to one in 20,000. The standards we applied during the two hours in which we observed your every action and reaction raises the mathematical incidence of your sensory acuity to approximately one in 100,000. I'm flattered. You'll have greater reason to be if our experiment proves successful. You will be the only man on Earth possessed of your powers. You will be the man from tomorrow. How do you propose to go about that? We will first show you how we've trained other individuals. Dr. Frost, will you proceed with the demonstration? Come in, Mr. Logan. Mr. Logan, have you ever been in this part of the laboratories before? No. Would you describe it, please? It is a rectangular room, 40 by 20. The ceiling is uh, 18 and a half feet high. There's a desk 12 feet from me, slightly to my right. There are two people seated at it. One has just risen. That will be all. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Well, Mr. Kenman? Well, it'd be very impressive if any schoolboy with normal vision couldn't do as well. Agreed. Mr. Logan is totally blind. Looking back now, I can hardly believe my own impressions. A blind man was followed by a deaf mute, then by a paraplegic who'd lost all sense of touch and smell demonstrations were incredible. Not one of these persons possessed physical senses above the average. The deprivation of one sense or another, in the case of the blind or the deaf man, stimulated nature's desire to compensate for the loss. But what are you trying to prove? That man has powers even now that are beyond his comprehension. We wish to explore those powers. Suppose one, one nearly perfect man, with superior sensory perception to begin with, could develop the extension of his five senses to the maximum degree we've just observed. What do you think would happen? I don't know. Neither do we. But it is our conviction that this man would also acquire a new sense, a sixth sense, that would endow him with a power never dreamed of before. Don't you think it's a dimension worth exploring? Uh, maybe. How could anybody accomplish that? By training. By producing the circumstances that surround the blind man, the deaf man, and the handicapped, you would have to agree to cut yourself off from the outside world for three years. You would spend six months living in a pitch-dark laboratory. You would eat, sleep, eat, function in a world of darkness. We will use various sound devices to train and measure your hearing responses. 
After that, six months will be devoted to simulating the world of the deaf-mute, and so on. You will be paid $20,000 at the end of the three years. All the necessities of living will be provided during that time. Then a test will be made, and if our predictions are realized, you will be signed for an additional five years at $20,000 per year. Dr. Frost will be in charge of the training program. Do you wish to undertake it? Well, that's a pretty serious move. I, I'd like to think about it. You have all the facts clearly, Mr. Kenman. We would like a decision now. You think feeling might enter into my considerations, Doctor? That's what you're afraid of? Afraid? Fear is merely an emotion, Mr. Kenman. I have learned to control all my emotions. I wonder. I beg your pardon? I was muttering again. What I meant to say is I agree to undertake your experiment. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, forest fires, nine out of every ten, are made by man. So redouble your efforts to eliminate forest fires. Crush out every cigarette. Break matches in two and grind them with your fingers. Douse down campfires and turn them over until no ember remains. Save a fortune in property and save human lives. And now, back to Escape. I was given two days to settle my affairs, such as they were. It meant saying goodbye to my landlady and packing a bag. And then I reported back to scientific associates, to Dr. Frost of the beautiful face and figure, all ice, and Professor Baird, tall, quiet, and clinical. I was led into a pitch-dark room, blacker than the blackest night that was to be my home for six months. It had a bed, bathroom, closets. All I had to do was find them. I won't waste time telling you what that was like. Just close your eyes tight and try to find your way around a room that's familiar to you. and You'll get the idea. I was still stumbling around three weeks later when I reported for my daily training with Dr. Frost in the adjoining laboratory, which was even blacker if possible. No. Are you hurt? No, oh, you wouldn't care if I broke my leg. There is a chair nearby. I know. I just fell over it. No. Oh. We can begin as soon as you're settled. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky it's so dark. I'd have to apologize for wearing my pajamas. Don't you like dressing? Oh, I love it. When I can find my pants. <clears throat> Today's exercise will be recognition of pure tones. Here is an example. That is 1,000 cycles, or 1,000 vibrations per second, stripped of all harmonics. What would you say that was? Oh, uh, 1,100. It is 1,500 cycles. Hmm. Now, please tell me when you begin to hear the next tone and what the frequency is. I couldn't make the slightest dent in that glacial reserve. Tried to match her at her own game for a while, but she loved it, and I'm human. Anyway, at the end of the sixth month, I could ramble through the whole place and never stub my toe. It was amazing how you learned to sense things in the dark and what your ears could do. 800. Oh, 4,000. Out. Good. Excellent. Mr. Kenman, you're 20 decibels greater than the average ear. That's very good. Oh, Dr. Frost, I, I can't see you, but uh, do I take a note of enthusiasm in your voice? Satisfaction, Mr. Kenman. The experiment Dr. so far... Dr. Frost, have you ever let yourself go? 
Mr. Hinman, I'm not nearly so naive as you assume, nor have any of your innuendos or mumblings for the past six months escaped me. I told you in the beginning that neither your feelings nor mine would have any bearing on you this You haven't project. answered my question. I am fully aware of the nature of biological stresses. In a scientific way, of course. What distinguishes man from the animal is his understanding of these stresses, but mostly his control. Control is a traffic cop with a stop sign, Doctor, but eventually the traffic has to go somewhere. I can understand the frustration of your masculine ego, especially in this forced loneliness of the experiment. Thank you. But we have only begun. We have two years or more to go. The first phase is highly successful. As a scientist, I am very pleased. Strange. My hearing is so good that I have yet to hear your heartbeat. Then there was light again, but no hearing. They devised some newfangled earplugs, and I began six months of silence. Six months of being deaf as a doorknob. Deaf, but not quite deaf, because I began to see sounds, to feel sounds, like waves against my skin. I began to hear with my body, with my pores. Have you ever touched a sound? Ever seen thunder? You get so you can look at sounds, almost see the waves they make trembling in the air. And have you ever tried silence? Try. Not saying a word, not a syllable for an hour or a day. I tried it for six months. Until all the unsaid words piled up inside my head clung like unborn sounds at the back of my throat. Whoever said silence is golden never felt the lump of lead that accumulates inside you. Silence. Then the six months ended, and I felt the vibrations of her footsteps down the long hall. And I saw the door opening, a split second before you would normally see it open, for my eyes were my ears, and they were a jump ahead of what they'd ever been before. I saw her lips move, and I could read every word. In a moment, you will hear again. In just a moment. Then she removed the fancy earplugs and the little canyon I'd been living in widened to a continent. And then her moving lips became sounds. Can you hear now? Can you hear me? Nod to me or raise your finger when you can hear the sound of my voice. Oh, I, I heard you five minutes ago. Were the plugs defective? No, no, I read your lips. Incidentally, I take it it's okay for me to talk now. Of course. <laughs> Have I been a good boy? Have I done everything you've wanted? <laughs> so much so, Mr. Kenman, that we're giving you a few days rest before we begin your training for taste and touch. Can I do anything I want? Anything. Within reason. I'd like to have a drink. Strangely enough, I'd like to have you join me. Perhaps that can be arranged. Oh. <laughs> by the way, do you have a first name, or are you only a title followed by Frost, huh? followed by a long string of degrees? Oh. My first name is Jessica. Jessica? Oh, that's more like it. Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> After all that silence, it's good just to say a woman's name. Well, until the experiment is completely over, Mr. Kenman, it had better remain Dr. Frost. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Jessica Frost, plus degrees. <laughs> but when I get to take you out for a drink as a normal human being and not as a guinea pig... Let's us go to a cocktail bar where they don't cheat. Cheat? No. You ask for a particular brand, this bartender pours out a few drops of it and then fills the rest of the jigger with some of that cheap stuff behind the bar. How do you know? Oh, I've been trained in these little subtleties of life by a mastermind. 
For one thing, I can spot the different gurgling sounds of the bottles. And then, too, I seem to have an uncanny knack these days of seeing around corners. Good, good. Well, despite the watered-down booze, I give you a toast. <clears throat> to you. You've been very cooperative about this. Mr. Kenman, I want you to know that I like you very much. Well, now I'm sure the experiment is a success because I've developed a sixth sense. I distinctly heard a lovely lady saying, I like you very much, and that couldn't possibly have been you. Oh. <laughs> I rather enjoyed the touch tests. It was one area I'd never realized held such hidden powers. After a few months, my fingertips knew the difference between crystal and diamonds. I could tell if you had a suntan merely by touching your cheek. And as for the taste test, food suddenly became a symphony concert. Sourness had many degrees. Sweetness had a range as wide as the spectrum of a rainbow. And then, then all of my highly developed senses brought on a new perception, something over and beyond, something added to the rest. More than a summation of all the senses. Did you ever swerve the steering wheel of your car suddenly without knowing why, and then you realize the move saved your life? Or one day you thought of an old friend whom you hadn't seen or communicated with in years, and then you found a letter from him in the box that morning? Coincidence? Black magic? I once thought so. I didn't anymore. I had a knowledge beyond knowledge. Sit down, Mr. Kent. Thank you. Your period of training has been completed. We've taken the final tests, and we've decided to retain you. Will you execute the contract, please, Mr. Kenman? It's the arrangement as decided. $20,000 a year for the next five years. Is anything wrong, Mr. Kenman? No, nothing wrong. Not now. Mr. Kenman, what are you doing? Obviously, I'm not signing it. Why? Because I'm afraid. What is there to be afraid of? Of myself, Professor. Of what I know now, what I'm going to know in the future. Of, of what you and Dr. Frost may ask me to do. Afraid to make contribution to scientific progress? Undreamed of progress? Professor, remember the sixth sense you gave me. Do you know what I can see? I can see beyond the test tubes and the telescopes, all your theories and experiments... And I don't see one important thing. I don't see happiness. Only fear in falling buildings. That's all I see coming out of my super sense. I suppose then that you think that all my work, our work, is to go to death and destruction? It might. That's not fair. Isn't it? What happens if I sign the contract? Who makes the decisions? These are things... I can't honestly answer. I know. That's what I mean. It might be out of your hands, then. Governments would pay billions for me. Our own country would guard me like Fort Knox. I would be the most valuable thing in the world. Alive, even more valuable for some people dead. But a thing, not a man. That's not going to be for me. Not that way. All this work. Everything we've done doesn't mean anything, then. It's all for nothing. I don't know. I'm sorry. I guess you picked the wrong man for the job. What are you going to do now? Pack my things. Go away. I don't know where. It doesn't really matter. Jessica. I probably won't see you again before I go. Thanks for everything. And I'm sorry you feel that I've let you down. So long. Oh, 
I was just going to... Try to talk me out of it. No. Yes, I was, but not anymore. Oh. I'm very glad you changed your mind. What are you going to do? I don't know. Not yet. It's kind of funny. Going out of here almost the way I came. One suitcase, hat and coat. Only difference, I... I've got all the knowledge of the world up here. I don't know what I'll do with it. I, I haven't been able to think. Not clearly. I know one thing, though. There are a lot of things I can try. What? Cancer, heart disease, a dozen other things. Yes. Might not be bad for a start. Oh, that's not bad for a start. Uh. Do you think you might need someone to help? Yes. Yes, I, I, I think I might. I've talked to Professor Baird. I think perhaps he understands. Ah, uh, does he? Yes. <laughs> it's... It's a little uncomfortable for a woman. I'm not supposed to say anything until you do. You already know what I'm thinking, don't you? Let's be old-fashioned. I love you. Will you come with me? Yes. I love you, too. I know. Well, come on, let's go. Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you The Man from Tomorrow by Irving Reese, starring Lawrence Dobkin as Dix. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Edgar Berrier, Kurt Martell, Jack Carroll, and Barney Phillips. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week, we present a story of two boys and the dreadful game which they played them. You might have read about it in your newspaper. It might have happened in your town. And if it did, it must never happen again. Well, that is a great story. No way around it. Also, I think there's some real truth to be had here. It is a fact that the body will make up for a loss. I've talked to numerous folks who were sighted, and to a man they have said that their sense of touch and hearing improved dramatically after their loss. I'm not so sure that it would only take six months per loss, but hey, who can say? The narrator of Escape was William Conrad, best known for his radio role as Matt Dillon on Gunsmoke. He had a pretty good TV series, too, called Canon, which as a kid, I never missed. But did you know that he had a more famous brother? Hard to believe, but true. Robert Conrad starred in the television series The Wild Wild West, and then went on to portray World War II ace Pappy Boington in the series Baba Black Sheep, also a favorite series of mine. Most incredibly, he was a singer and recorded several pop rock songs in the late 1950s and early 1960s as Bob Conrad. His brother William would do some backing vocals for him. How about that? He hosted a weekly two-hour national radio show, The PM Show with Robert Conrad, on CRN Digital Talk Radio beginning in 2008. Robert passed quite recently in 2020 from heart failure and a COVID-19 infection. The two brothers made their mark in history, and I have to tell you that I loved their work. Johnny, is this true? As you know by now, I like to surf the internet to find the strange and unusual. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, 
I would do it anyway, even if there was no podcast. What you're about to hear is... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Your job is to decide. Let's get started. Johnny, is this true? This time we have something pretty special. Kevin Bishop of Newark, New Jersey, has collected four stories for us. All have come from the pages of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Or have they? Here is an explanation from Kevin himself. Hello, Ron. I've collected a few strange stories for the podcast. Some could be true, or some just might have been made up. Can you tell me which is which? It is my hope that you will use them for the Johnny Is It True segment. This was all inspired by Sylvia's Lights Out podcast on Ripley's Believe It or Not. Kevin. Well, Kevin, that was a fun podcast, and I have to say, let's see what you got. Story 1. A 150-pound tortoise named Solomon decided that he'd had enough of his humdrum life in Ashland City, Tennessee, and he took off on a not-so-whirlwind adventure. The sulcata tortoise ended up taking in the sights until he was found on a construction site about an eighth of a mile away from home. His owner, Lynn Cole, was devastated by his disappearance and started a community-wide search party. Their efforts worked out and they were able to retrieve Solomon, who they'd had since he was a hatchling 15 years ago. When they arrived, he was covered in mud, but well-fed, having snacked on plants during his time on the lamb. The Coles, well, they're currently looking into tracking devices. Now, did this one come from the pages of Ripley's, or is it just tortoise fakery? This was first reported on June 8th of this year, and is totally true. I guess we'll never know the full details of Solomon's great adventure and how he managed to elude us for so long, Cole said. Solomon is now safely at home, and one of the first thing he did was enjoy a meal of his favorite treats, which included collard greens, broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, bananas, and watermelon rinds. Story 2. There are some folks who just don't get it. Jason White decided one morning that having to mow his lawn was just too much of a bother and he just let the grass grow. His neighbors were unhappy about this decision and decided to confront the man. He laughed at them and did not comply. Boiling with anger, his next-door neighbor decided that a good scare would get that grass cut, so he put his cat in the front yard and waited for the fun. Jason came out of his home that afternoon and was attacked by the feline that was hiding in the tall grass. That evening, he mowed his lawn. Why? Well, you see, the cat was actually a 500-pound tiger named Reggie. Now, did this tiger story happen, or is it just mythology? This is totally untrue. Kevin, that was a good one, and I have to be honest and say that I guessed it wrong. I thought this was so impossible that it had to be true. Story 3 Are you familiar with the plotline of the movie Weekend at Bernie's? It turns out that it's not all that far-fetched after all. Drew Barrymore confirmed the longtime rumor that her grandfather's body was stolen from the morgue. She said that it's not only true, but it also inspired the film. Come on now, Kevin, that can't be right. It's just too weird. Well, again, I am wrong. This one is totally true and confirmed by Drew herself. After his death in 1942, actor John Barrymore's corpse was stolen by a few friends. 
These included actors W.C. Fields and Errol Flynn. You see, they wanted to host a going-away party for their friend and late actor. When Drew was asked about it, she said that she's hoping for the same kind of send-off from her friends. She said, That's the kind of spirit I can get behind. Just prop the old bag up. Story 4 Our last story has to be impossible, right? Fabrican, an instant spray-on fabric based in London. Fabrican technology is capturing the imagination of designers, industry, and the public around the world. The technology has been developed for use in industrial applications as well as personal apparel. A British company developed a way to bond and liquefy fibers so that textiles can be sprayed out of a can or spray gun directly onto a nude body. The solvent then evaporates and the fibers bond, forming a snug-fitting garment. No way is this true. Yes way. This is a totally true and brand new product. I watched a video of models being sprayed with the stuff and the results were amazing. I will have a link to that video in the show notes. By the way, the fabric is so sterile it can be used as a bandage. Also, it can be set hard to be used as a cast for broken bones. But perhaps most amazingly, the fabric absorbs oil, and so it could be used for cleanup after oil tanker disasters. How about that? Well, that's it for this edition of Johnny Is It True? I hope you enjoyed it, and I really want to thank Kevin Bishop for sharing his stories with us. Thank you, Kevin. Do you have any strange but true stories you want to share? If you do, send them to ronsamazingstories at gmail.com, and I'll use them if I can. What's puzzling you, Ethelbert? One of those quizzes, and it says here, uh, what are these men famous for? Sidney Porter, Samuel Clemens, Charles Dodgson. Well, they're all great authors. Well, how come I never heard of them? Well, you would if they printed their pen names. They're O. Henry, Mark Twain, and Lewis Carroll. Well, I'll be. Those names are famous. Everybody knows them. Mm -hmm. Like everybody knows Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. That was episode number 582, and we have two folks to thank for their contributions. Ariel Kistner for his story, and Kevin Bishop for writing our Johnny Is It True segment. Thank you, guys. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.